Okay, so it's 7.30, so it's time to start our January film reading session. A very good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening um, to have a little chat about uh, a few of uh, the cases that we've seen at LVS over the last month. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to take a look at them. But before we look at the cases, for those of you who haven't attended these sessions in the past, a very brief introduction. Uh, my name is Ian. And I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the Royal Benton College in 2004. I got my RCVS certificate in 2009 and I got my European diploma in 2018 after completing an imaging residency again at the Royal Veterinary College between 2013 and 2016. Uh, these days uh, you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists which is the only multidisciplinary referral hospital in central London. So if you have any questions at all about any of this evening's cases, or if you need a hand at interpreting some radiographs, or you'd like a chat about an um, interesting or complicated case that you're working up and you're not quite sure which imaging modality would be most useful, then you can give me a call at the clinic or drop me a line via email. So this evening, just like in our December session, we are going to be using some interactive software for those of you who are a little bit too shy to present. Uh, so the program is called Poll Everywhere. And if you would like to participate, you need to go to polleverywhere.com and enter Ian David Joni 636 as the username. And uh, once you've logged in, then you should be able to see uh, the questions um, as they appear. And that's uh, really uh, for those of you who would like to get involved, um, but, as I say, I may be a little reluctant to present one of these cases. Um, however, there are four cases, and uh, that gives uh, some of you some uh, opportunity to flex your radiological muscles. So before uh, we go any further, uh, we are going to have a look at an example, uh, which is a six-month-old male neutered Yorkshire Terrier. So this is a, a case that we uh, looked at uh, last month. Hold on a second. Okay. And this is a dog that presented to us as vomiting. So because this is an example, we'll just have a single lateral radiograph to look at. And in this radiograph, we can see that there is a poorly marginated increase in soft tissue opacity just at the level of the hilus. And this poorly marginated increase in soft tissue opacity also has a mineralized component. So just superimposed over the ribs, we can see there's um, a little structure that looks mineralized. Its opacity is almost uh, equivalent to that of the adjacent thoracic vertebra and the ribs. Just cranial to that, um, we have a gas lucency, which probably represents gas within the esophageal lumen. So uh, our top differential for this patient would be an um, esophageal foreign body, and our recommendations would be that this patient has endoscopy to confirm our diagnosis and to retrieve the esophageal foreign body. So let's move on and take a look at some of our other cases. Before we do so, for those of you who would like to use the online interactive software, I have now activated the first question. So if you've logged in, then you should be able to see that question and you uh, should be able to respond. So if you have any questions about this example, or if you're happy uh, with the radiographic description that I provided, then you can express your opinions via the software. So we have a couple of responses. So let's see if this will sync up and work. Okay, which it does, excellent. So you guys are all happy with case number one, which is great. So we will be using the Pull Everywhere software for some of the other cases as well. And 
indeed. That brings us on to case number one, uh, which is a two-year-old Great Dane uh, that's presented as vomiting. Um, so only a single radiograph for this case. Uh, so which of you guys feels confident enough to take on case number one? I can see that there are 11 of us in attendance. And this is a pretty straightforward case. It's certainly something that Hi. you would have seen in first opinion practice. Hello, Ian. Hey. I can do it if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm maybe biased because um, I had one case this last week. Okay. Yeah, no, these, I think these I can are... see something because of that. Yeah. Um, but this is a lateral view of an abdomen of a very large dog. Um, the the first thing that comes uh, to my eyes is the stomach. Okay. Um, so in the stomach, I think I can see a double bubble, um, yeah. that may be me. So you can see the structure uh, on the dorsal area that is looking like a C shape. Yeah. Um, and then there is kind of like a second bubble, which is more um, radio pack that looks more like a content okay. yeah. yeah um and i i have seen one of the questions already from the poll but the thing you were asking about where is the pillars and i think yeah in an abnormal position um the spleen to me looks normal um it looks like it's in the ventral aspect of the abdomen near to the liver okay um so i think that's located in the normal position but i would say that this dog potential has a gdv okay um, yeah, but again, I, uh, I, I had one case last week, so I think uh, I just see GDBs everywhere now. No, no, I, I think that's a uh, very good suggestion. So you've already alluded to the fact that um, there is another question in our poll that relates to a very specific and extremely important feature um, in this case. And, and that is essentially, where is the pylorus, which is the question that I'm about to ask you guys right now. So. Again, for those of you who would like to join in, this, uh, this question is uh, slightly different. So you guys um, get to point at it. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to use your Poll Everywhere software and point to the pylorus, um, then once everybody has responded, or at least everybody has had a chance to respond, then we'll take a look and see what the opinion of the group is as to where the pylorus is. And the reason why the position of the pylorus is so important when making a diagnosis of a GDV um, is essentially that's what makes it a volvulus. Um, so the pylorus is an abnormal location. Um, typically, um, it would be a dorsal in a bilateral radiograph, then that really nails it on um, as a GDV. So let's take a little look at Pull Everywhere and let's see if we can sync this up. Okay, great. So we've got a few little responses here. Some of them are correct, not all of them. Um, so the double bubble that uh, Mitre referred to, one of the bubbles, and the smaller of the two bubbles is in fact the pylorus. So, so this structure here is the pylorus, and that pylorus um, should be down here. So this pylorus is way more dorsal than it should be. And if the pylorus is in an abnormal location, um, so normally it would be ventral, um, and it would be on the right, and in this case, um, it's dorsal, and we'll need to do, look at a VD radiograph. It would be on the left, um, then the stomach must be twisted, and therefore this uh, is a GDV. Um, so diagnosis is absolutely correct. Uh, however, there are some other radiographic features here that uh, we should just dwell on for a moment. So this is a GDV, and this is something that you guys uh, will have seen in practice before, and if you haven't, um, you certainly will. Um, the double bubble is uh, really the most significant radiographic feature, and the double bubble is due to um, sort of segmentalization of the gastric fundus because of the twist. Um, so you get soft tissue bands that crisscross the uh, gas that's in the gastric room, creating um, these two bubbles, uh, sometimes uh, called a Popeye arm. So if, if you imagine Popeye's arm, this is Popeye's fist, and this is Popeye's bicep. And if uh, this was Popeye, then it'd be an anchor just here on this bicep. So a double bubble or Popeye arm, absolutely, 
this is a GDP. But there are other things here that um, we should be picking up on too. So anybody else see any other pertinent radiographic features that they'd like to add to MITRE's description? Uh, I can add that it's not really clear, but I think that in the portion of the lungs, the, the thorax that we can see, there is some uh, alveolar pattern in the um, caudal uh, lung lobe. Yeah, uh, there yeah. is like superimposed with the rib, but I can see an, al an alveolar pattern. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so um, can everybody see that? So if if we look in the cordoventral thorax here, just superimposed over the cardiac silhouette, um, we can see some air bronchograms. So there are these branching radiolucent structures that are bronchi. They're surrounded by infiltrate that is both within the interstitium and the alveoli. And we know that because these are in fact air bronchograms. And the fact that they're air bronchograms means that we can describe this as an alveolar pattern. So um, we've got some consolidation of this ventral lung. And given its position in this lateral radiograph, um, it's likely that this is um, the right middle lung lobe. It has a ventral distribution, um, which is uh, exactly the distribution we'd expect in a patient that has a pneumonia. Um, and given this dog has a GDV, it's likely that it's been vomiting and that it's aspirated. And not only does it have a GDV, but it also has an aspiration pneumonia as well. So yeah, good job. Hopefully all of you guys can see these bronchograms here, this alveolar pattern. And hopefully you'd be super confident about saying, not only does this dog have a GDV, but it also has an aspiration pneumonia. Anything else here that we should be picking up? with our radiographic assessment. Because there's, there's at least one other feature of this radiograph that I'd like you guys to see. Not as significant as the two things that we've already spoken about, but certainly worth mentioning. And uh, could very well be related to the aspiration pneumonia that we've already picked up. So we've already talked about the, the spleen and Sounds like Mitre was reasonably happy with the position of the spleen. Um, and, and I'd agree, I think uh, potentially we can see a little bit more of the body of the spleen here than we normally would. Um, but it's, it's difficult to know whether or not there's going to be a degree of torsion there until you go in. Certainly some of the other radiographic features that you'd see with uh, splenic torsion, like a very large spleen and potentially some loss of peritoneal and spherical detail, we're not seeing in this radiograph. What do you guys think this, this structure is here? So there are two soft tissue opaque linear opacities just bisecting the dorsocaudal thorax in this dog. And it's not a trick question, nothing too complicated. What could that be? Megasophagus? Yeah, absolutely. So this dog also has a megasophagus. And um, that is something that you can see in dogs that have a GDV. Um, you can also see a uh, functional paralytic ileus as well. So it's not uh, unusual to see dogs that have this classic double bubble and also have a whole bunch of uh, dilated small intestines either superimposed on the stomach um, or caudal to the stomach. And also megasophagus. Um, so uh, this dog um, doesn't have a functional paralytic ileus as far as we can tell, but it's such a giant dog that we really only have the, the cranial abdomen in this view, um, but it does have megasophagus. And the fact that it has a megasophagus kind of ties in with the fact that it's got an aspiration in the as well. So uh, we can link those two things up uh, quite nicely. The only other feature that I might mention is just eyeballing the caudal vena cava. It looks a little bit small, uh, given that this is a Great Dane, and a lot of dogs that um, have a uh, GDV uh, in hypovolemic shock. And the things that you see on a thoracic radiograph in a dog with hypovolemic shock would be a small heart and, and a small cava. So it might be worth just commenting on this cava being a, a little bit smaller than I'd expect. Uh, difficult to really be confident about a microcardia here because we've only really got the caudal two thirds of the cardiac silhouette. Um, but that wouldn't be unreasonable to also put on your radiographic report. Uh, the only other feature that I might comment on 
is that there is something called uh, gastric pneumatosis, which is where you get uh, gas uh, permeating the wall of the stomach. And if you see it, uh, then um, you can be pretty confident that as well as there being a twist in the stomach, there's also gastric necrosis. So the stomach has been twisted for long enough such that the stomach wall has started to become ischemic and it started to necrose. And if that has started to happen, then on radiographs, we'll see little slivers of, of gas within the gastric wall. Now, I'm not convinced that I can see any evidence of a gastric pneumatosis in this patient, but it's something that you guys should be aware of and it's something that you should be looking for when you're assessing radiographs of patients that have a GDV, because if you can see evidence of gastric pneumatosis, then it's, it's more than likely that uh, that patient has a degree of gastric necrosis, which means that you might end up having to resect part of the stomach when you are doing surgery to correct the volvulus, and that has quite a negative impact on that patient's prognosis. So it might affect uh, your and the owner's clinical decision-making in terms of whether or not to take this patient to surgery. So yeah, GDV, which is uh, a nice straightforward one to start off, but with a few little extras, um, like the sneaky little aspiration pneumonia, um, just on the edge of the film there, um, and also this microesophagus. So yeah, good job. Right. Let us move on to case number two, uh, which is uh, a nine-year-old male neutered Dalmatian um, that's presented to us uh, coughing. Um, so, uh, there are a couple of radiographs uh, for this case. Um, so we've got two laterals um, and a DV. So anybody like to take a crack at case number two? This one is a little more challenging than case number one, in that the diagnosis uh, isn't that easy to get straight off the bat, but it's all about the radiographic description and putting all of those pertinent features together to come up with what you think is the most likely diagnosis. I can have a go. Yeah, go for it. So we do have three radiographic projection, um, a DV, a right lateral and a left lateral of a skeletal immature dog. Um, there are no abnormalities, as far as I can see, um, within the musculoskeletal structure. However, there is a really subtle uh, ventral spondylosis within the um, thoracic, uh, uh, the thoracic uh, vertebral yeah. column. Um, the, <clears throat> there is a um, sort of patchy uh, perihilar um, increase of almost nodular, increase of tissue opacity um, is more severe in the uh, caudodorsal aspect, uh, like surrounding essentially the, um, the main stain bronchi um, within the pulmonary parenchyma. Um, in some areas, like dorsal, like caudodorsal at the carina, it looks like uh, almost more alveolar pattern um, we can we can almost see um, like the the, bron the, the, the bronchial uh, the terminal bronchus um, filled by air, so there is a, a mild bronchogram there. Yeah. Um, the the cardiac silhouette uh, it looks like um, enlarged, subtly enlarged. I mean, it's uh, around four intercostal space, and there is a. Um, I think really subtle um, dorsal displacement of the trachea as well. Um, I think there is a mild bulging at the level of, uh, it's like at one, two o'clock of the, of the cardiac silhouette, which is more visible in the DV projection, but is also visible um, in the lateral um, because it has a sort of Con there is a sort of concavity of the shape um, at the level of, um, of the left atrium, essentially. Um, the stomach is, um, I mean, the fundus of the stomach is uh, uh, partially dilated by, by gas. Uh, and the, the, liver, the liver silhouette is within the costal arch uh, with um, 
sharp border. So overall, um, there is this sort of patchy and structure um, interstitia slash alveolar pattern. Um, more um, essentially more organized, more localized within the perihylar region um, with uh, some subtle layer bronchogram and this bulging at the level of the um, of the left atrium. So I, I would say this dog, he may have pulmonary edema with um, mitral valve disease. Yeah, yeah, no, um, excellent. Uh, very good radiograph description and um, very reasonable conclusions. Um, so what I'm gonna do before we chat any more about this case is I'm just going to activate the next question on Paul Everywhere, uh, which is, uh, what sort of disease process do you think is, is most likely? Um, so um, what I'd like everybody to do, um, based on um, that excellent radiograph really description, uh, come up with uh, an answer as to what you think is most likely going on here. Is it something inflammatory? Is it something neoplastic? Is there something infectious going on? Or is there something else that we maybe need to look at? So let's just set those up. So this is uh, a pretty tricky case because not only do we have to look at the pulmonary parenchyma, we have to look at all of the other structures, including the cardiac cell. Okay, so uh, the majority have gone for other, um, which. Uh, I think is, is absolutely reasonable based on the description that uh, you gave. Um, we've got um, about a third saying it could still be something neoplastic. Um, so let's go back and take another look at these radiographs. So uh, I, I absolutely agree with your description. Um, I think um, that there is um, a really uh, quite heavy interstitial pattern here. And I think in places um, it becomes more severe to the point where you can almost call it alveolar and I absolutely agree with your assessment of the distribution in that it, it seems to be more severe in the hyla region and dorsally and caudally. Um, I completely agree with the comment that the cardiac silhouette looks enlarged and also that there is um, some steepening of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette in the lateral views, which would be indicative of, say, left atrial enlargement, and potentially also some associated dorsal displacement of the trachea. Um, you're absolutely right that in this DV view, there is a little bulge here uh, between one and two o'clock. So when we're talking about enlargement in the DV views, um, we tend to use the clock face analogy. Uh, between uh, one and two o'clock, would be sort of left oracle, left atrium. So, so the left atrium lives sort of here, which is why uh, you tend to get the, the cowboy sign classically in patients that have mitral valve disease and a markedly enlarged left atrium. Um, so if you imagine that the lumen of the trachea is the cowboy's back and the um, lobar bronchi um, are his legs, then um, if the cowboy is, is sat on a, a really big horse, then, then the legs are all bendy and bow-legged. I'm, I'm not really convinced we can see the cowboy sign here. It's, it's difficult to really make out those uh, lobar bronchi. Um, uh, but the angle, angle of bronchial divergence, which is really what we're talking about, looks okay. But, but you're absolutely right. There is a bulge in between one and two o'clock, which could be the left one. Um, so uh, the other thing that it's probably worth commenting on, given that uh, the fact that we've got a uh, patchy alveolar pattern, which has a hyla and dorsocaudal distribution and some evidence of cardiac disease. So a cardiomegaly and specifically a left atrial enlargement um, is, uh, do we think there's any evidence of pulmonary venous engorgement? Um, so if, if this patient is in failure, and that's certainly what we're leaning towards, then we'd expect the pulmonary veins to be bigger than the arteries. Um, so in the lateral view, it's the cranial lobar artery and vein that we tend to look at. And uh, we always uh, remember the rhyme veins of ventral and veins of central. So in the lateral view, veins of ventral. So we've got artery, bronchus, and vein. So this, this is probably one of the pulmonary veins to the cranial lung lobes. And it does look kind of chunky in this lateral view. 
Um, it's pretty tricky to see them in this DV view because um, it's not the best radiograph in the world. Um, here you can maybe see a bronchus and the artery and vein adjacent to it, maybe here, but it's not particularly convincing. Um, in this lateral view, I can maybe convince you that that pulmonary vein is, is a little bit bigger than the artery, a little bit bigger than it should be. Um, so what we're left with is a patient that is coughing, um, but that has a uh, patchy alveolar pattern that has a hilar and the dorsocaudal distribution. Um, it has cardiomegaly and it has evidence of left atrial enlargement. And there's a suspicion that there's also some pulmonary venous enlargement as well. So there's pulmonary venous engorgement and uh, all of that uh, should allow us to conclude that um, in all likelihood there is primary cardiac disease here and we're pretty suspicious that not only is there primary cardiac disease but this patient is starting to go into left-sided failure and uh, that's absolutely what was happening in this case uh, so uh, it's it's interesting that um, some of you guys were concerned um, that there might be something neoplastic going on here and, and certainly that that was also um, a concern when these radiographs were uh, assessed initially. Um, and I can't tell you that this dog definitely doesn't have something neoplastic going on in its lungs, but what I can tell you is um, it definitely does have primary heart disease. So this patient um, went on and had an echo. Now, because this is a bigger dog, so this is a Dalmatian, and we're suspicious that it has primary heart disease, and that primary heart disease is manifest as uh, a cardiomegaly and a left atrial enlargement. My top differential for this dog was DCM, essentially. Um, it's, it's a big dog, it has primary heart disease, so DCM um, is going to be uh, the top differential, particularly given that we're seeing the evidence of left atrial enlargement. Um, actually, it, it turned out to have a congenital mitral dysplasia, um, which is a little bit more unusual, um, but the end result is still the same. Um, so left-sided cardiac disease resulting in um, left-sided failure um, and pulmonary edema. Um, so yeah, good job. Uh, does anybody have any questions about case number two? And that's, that's a tricky case, so really well done for taking that one on and um, doing an excellent job of uh, describing the changes and coming to the correct conclusion. If everybody is happy, then... Um, I have a question about this case. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the uh, right lateral, there's some increased sternal contact. So um, does that mean there's some right hearted involvement as well? Uh, so there is there is maybe some increased sternal contact in that right lateral view. Uh, typically in the DV view, if there was significant right sided enlargement, then we'd expect to see the reverse D sign. Um, so the cardiac silhouette should look like a reverse D. And I don't think it does here. I, I, think, I think we've, if, if, if you forget about this little bulge here, which is the left oracle, then I think it, it, it pretty much retains its uh, teardrop shape. Um, I think the slight increase in internal contact that we've got here is, is because of the diffuse cardiomegaly rather than specifically right-sided enlargement. Um, I can't remember what the echo report said here, but the most significant change on the echo was the fact that there was a big left atrium. Um, and I think that that's certainly the most um, significant change here as far as the cardiac cylinder goes. So it's big, and because it's big, there is increased sternal contact. Um, but in both our lateral views, we've got this steeping of the caudal border of the cardiac cylinder. And in the DV, we've got this bulge between one and two o'clock. So because the, the heart globally is a little enlarged, then the right side is going to be a little enlarged, which I think is why we've got some increased sternal contact. But the changes are predominantly left-sided. So when we're thinking about differentials, we should be thinking about left-sided rather than right-sided cardiac disease. Oh, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Because this is a tricky one. If not, we shall move on to something a little different. Um, this is one for the orthopods amongst you. So eight-year-old male neutered Labradoodle. Labradoodle is presented to us with an acute onset right hind limbus. So we've got a few 
views, we've got a VD pelvis, we've got medial lateral views of both the right and the left stifle, and we've got quadricranial views of the right and the left stifle. So, anybody fancy talking about this species? I can give a go. Yeah, go for it. Then. So, starting from the DV, the what is a skeletal mature dog is well uh, positioned. If I'm focused on uh, on the hip. I don't see any particular changes. So if we instead uh, move forward to the stifle, on the lateral view, uh, if we look at the right stifle, you can see slightly, it's like subtle, I think, but like a cranial displacement of the tibia. Um, but the most significant change that I that I can point is that on the right side there is like an increase of opacity into the joint, and uh, I, I may describe it as like a fat pad sign. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if we move on the uh, on the other projection, the craniocaudal. Uh, I may look for uh, any sign of joint effusion uh, or presence of osteophyte. I don't see any osteophyte on this view and uh, neither on the other one. There may be a subtle uh, joint effusion, but as well, uh, I think that is like um, like the opacity, the exposure of both limb is not the same, so I may be wrong. So for me, the main change is like on the lateral view, this fat pad sign and this sub subtle cranial displacement of the tibia. So my main differential would be a cranial cruciate disease because uh, it was an acute onset. I'm, I'm not seeing already, I'm not seeing any osteophytes that normally appears uh, on the patella and uh, behind uh, uh, the femur epicondyles, but I don't, I cannot see any of them. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a nice description. Uh, so uh, what uh, I would like to do before we talk any more about this um, is just to uh, open this up to the group. So. Uh, based on B's uh, radiographic description, which uh, was great, um, I'd like you guys just to point out to me where you think the inflammation is here. Just to convince me that you guys know um, what the most pertinent features are here, and if you were to see this again, you would be able to see it and know exactly what. So we've got a few responses. Let's sync it up and see what we get. Yeah, okay, so the vast majority of you guys think that there's inflammation in the joint here. And I agree, this this, uh, this individual here has just pointed caudal to the joint, and I, I don't disagree. Um, I think uh, there probably is some caudal bulging of that joint capsule as well. So let's uh, go back and take a little look at these lateral radiographs again. And happily, um, we have got the uh, affected limb, so the right hind right next to the medial view of um, the stifle of the left hind, so we can effectively play spot the difference here. And hopefully um, you guys can appreciate that in the right stifle joint, um, we've got this uh, poorly marginated increase in soft tissue capacity. So we've got a margin here between tissue that has an opacity equivalent to soft tissue, so the muscles caudal to the joint and uh, tissue that has um, is less dense, so it's relatively more radiolucent. So what, what we're looking at here is we're looking at uh, inflammation within the joint and because of that inflammation, um, this, this fat pad here, so he was mentioning uh, cranial displacement of 
of the infrapatel fat pad, that's, that's being pushed cranially. So this is the inflammation, this increase in opacity here, this is the fat pad, this fat pad's being pushed cranially. If we compare it to the unaffected joint, um, then that, that little margin between the more uh, opaque tissue and the relatively more radiolucent tissue um, is, is just here. And this is the fat pad, and that looks much more normal. Um, so that little margin usually is at about the level of the extensive fossil, which, which we can't actually see in um, these joints, um, but it's it's at this level, so this is normal. Um, so that's what uh, a Steinfeld effusion looks like. So inflammation in the joint, as indicated and evidenced by an increase in opacity and displacement of that infrapatella fat pad. Um, if we compare the opacity of the area just caudal to this stifle joint. Um, for me, it looks a little bit more radio opaque on the right than it does the left. Um, so it could absolutely be that there is some caudal bulging of this joint capsule, which is, is also what you'd expect to see in a patient that had a marked stifle effusion. And in these quadricranial views as well, if you guys look at the opacity of the medial aspect of this right stifle joint, this is the opacity of the medial aspect of this left stifle joint. Um, it looks way more radio opaque on the right. And I take this point that um, it's possible that the uh, equivalent exposures weren't used for the right versus the left, um, but still that's that's something that I would include in my radiographic description, that not only does there appear to be a poorly marginated increase in opacity caudal to that right stifle joint, along with the increase in opacity within the joint and the displacement of that infrapatella fat pad, there also appears to be an increase in opacity just medial to the joint, um, which could also represent bulging of that joint capsule. Um, B is absolutely right. Um, you would expect to see some osteophytes in a patient that has a ruptured accretion ligament, particularly if it happened um, a little while ago. Um, although it doesn't take long um, for um, degenerative joint disease to develop in dogs that have ruptured accretions. Um, the only little area that I'd ping, I think, would be, would be this area here. So this is this is the lateral epicondyle of the tibia. Um, and on the right, um, it just looks a little bit more knobbly than it does um, on the left. So I wonder if that might be a tiny little osteophyte just starting to form there on that lateral tibial epicondyle. Uh, other than that, yeah, I, uh, I think you did um, an excellent job of describing all the radiographic features. I don't think there was anything else um, that I wanted you guys to see or to point out. Uh, I think everybody uh, pointed out uh, the inflammation, um, most of you the inflammation within the joint, and all of you the inflammation just um, caudal to the joint. Um, but yeah, I would agree. There's a, there's a marked stifle effusion here. And given this patient's history, so acute onset lameness, um, then something like I would appreciate would be top of the differential list. Um, the, the other thing that you guys might be doing um, if you suspected a cruciate rupture in this patient is when the patient was sedated or anesthetized for these radiographs, you'd have a palpate of that stifle joint and see if you could elicit a cranial draw. And I would expect this patient to have a cranial draw and a cruciate rupture. So yeah, good job. Um, anyone have any questions about this case, which is our sole orthopedic case of the evening. In which case, we shall move on to the final case, um, which uh, is, again, something uh, completely different. So this is a very young dog. So this is um, a three-week-old puppy. Um, it's a Brussels Griffon, which is not a breed that we see very often, um, but it's become uh, profoundly and acutely dyspneic. Um, you guys have uh, two radiographs to look at. Um, we've got uh, a DV, and that's probably a right Anybody fancy having a go at this one? I can have a go at it. Yeah, go for it. So, um... We have two views of this of radiographs from this three-week-old Brussels Griffin. It's a skeletally immature dog. It's a three-week-old puppy. Yeah. So on the um, on the VD, we there is an increased um, well-marginated soft tissue opacity in the left um, cranial lung lobe. 
there is also a um, shift of the um, trachea towards the right it's almost exerting a mass effect okay and on the right um, lateral the right lateral view the the lung borders are retracted from the chest wall just above the sternal area okay i think i then there is some soft tissue opacity in the pleural space there might be some effusion yeah it's, it's, it's tricky to see it is tricky to see the cardiac siloid here so there is maybe some effacement and uh, the similar soft tissue opacity that was seen on the vd can be seen um cranial and dorsal to the heart base okay we're um, looking into one this this area here yeah okay yeah okay um, so based on this and the clinical signs i guess my concern would be a lung lobe torsion of the left cranial lobe okay yeah yeah so I mean, three weeks old be pretty young for lung torsion, but uh, absolutely, those are the sort of changes that we might expect to see about the lung torsion. So, before we talk about it anymore, let's just ring that up and see what everybody thinks. So, again, paulev.com. We're working pretty well so far. So, the options I've given uh, don't include lung torsion, but they do include pneumothorax, heart failure, pulmonary mass, or something else. Let's see what you guys think. Okay, uh, so. The vast majority went for other, which I suppose could include lung torsion. So uh, yeah, you, you very well have convinced everybody about uh, this being a torsion. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. So left cranial lung lobe uh, would be a predilection sign for lung lobe torsion in uh, brachycephalic dogs, and particularly uh, pugs. Um, in big, deep-chested dogs, uh, it tends to be the right middle lung lobe that uh, twists rather than um, the cranial lung lobes. Um, so in dogs like pugs, it could be the left or the right. I think the left is more common, um, but I've certainly seen lung lobe torsions in right cranial lung lobes in pugs as well. Um, the other things that we would see with um, a lung lobe torsion um, would be some pleural effusion. Um, and I absolutely uh, take your point about the potential effacement of the cardiac silhouette in this uh, lateral view. Um, so it's really tricky to see what's going on ventrally here. We can maybe just see the edges of the cardiac silhouette, but it's pretty tricky um, to see the borders um, just ventrally here. Um, and this lateral view, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on at all, um, just because of the appearance um, of uh, the heart related to the pulmonary brain coming around it. Um, the other thing that we'd expect to see if this was a lung lobe torsion would be emphysematous change to the affected uh, lobe. Um, so that usually manifests as um, a very uh, stipple uh, gas opacity um, within the lung. And that's because uh, uh, when the lung twists, um, not only uh, do you get an accumulation of uh, venous blood within the lung, which is what causes the pleural effusion. So um, you, the venous blood can't get out of the lung, so it sits there. So you get sort of a fusion just oozing from that lung. Um, it's not possible for the gas that's in that lung lung to get out either. And as a result of that, it diffuses from the um, alveoli and the bronchi into the interstitium. And that results in this emphysematous type change which gives you this very characteristic sort of stippled gas pattern within the lung. Um, we're, not, we're not seeing that in this DV. Um, normally, if you've got a right cranial 
uh, lung lobe or left or right cranial lung lobe torsion, you can see the affected lobe here in the cranial ventral thorax, and, and that's that's where you'd be looking for this emphysematous type change, um, and also um, the emphysematous type change in, in the DV here as well. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what the answer is for this case, so I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what you guys think as well. Um, so I think lung lobe torsion uh, is a possibility. I think it's, it's, it's unlikely in such a young dog without some of the other changes that I expect to see with lung lobe torsion. So um, without um, a big emphysematous lung lobe, without more evidence of pleural effusion. So in this DV view, I don't really see any retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. I don't really see... Um, any pleural fissure lines, um, so I'm not entirely convinced there's, there's a fusion there. Um, I'm not seeing a big emphysematous lung lobe in the cranial ventral thorax in this lateral view, which is what I expect to see. Um, so uh, I can't say that it's not a lung lobe torsion. Like I say, I don't know what it is, but um, I'm not entirely convinced. Any anyone else have any suggestions? Um, but yeah, good description. Um, really liked it. I thought maybe a, a timoma, although it's very, very young. Yeah, so you're thinking that, that this soft tissue is like a mediastinal mass? Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, no, I, I, I can see that. So, um, I mean, again, if, if this was a mediastinal mass, then the soft tissue opacity in the DV would be more midline. So I mean, thymomas uh, typically are going to be in the cranial mediastinum. Sometimes they, they can sort of be a little bit more left-sided than right-sided, um, but this is this thing here is way over um, on the, the left. Um, so it's difficult for me to believe that that is a mediastinal mass. And, and if this was a big mediastinal mass, again, we'd see some soft tissue opacity here. A three a three week old pup, I think a five moment would be really unlikely because this thing is just it's just so young. Yeah, I'm sorry. On mm. the on the lateral view, like the ventral aspect of the diaphragmatic outline, um, they are not so well defined. Yeah, I so agree. it it looks like uh, there is this sort of soft tissue opacity that is coming from the 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 cranial aspect of the abdomen. Yeah. So, and, and because there is this effacement of the cardiac silhouette, which it looks um, of an amorphous shape, I may put on differential sort of uh, peritoneal pericardial uh, hernia. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's All, reasonable. Although in the DV, is no, I mean, in the DV you can see the diaphragmatic outline. I cannot yeah. see any connection on the DV. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think in this lateral view, um, again, it's, it's difficult for us to really make out the ventral margins of, of the diaphragm here. Um, it, it's tricky to see the uh, ventral borders of the cardiac silhouette here as well. Um, so it, it could be that there is a communication between the thorax and the abdomen here. Um, a lot of the abdominal organs, they look pretty all present and correct, really. Um, so we've got the, it's, it's, and it's tricky to see them because this is such a young dog. So the series of detail is, is really cool. Um, we've got the liver here, the stomach is here. Um, and it's difficult to believe that, that anything significant, like uh, any of this bowel or uh, the spleen or anything, might have slipped through the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity, uh, given the position of the liver and the relative position of the other abdominal organs. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's something that's worth considering. Um, the other thing with um, peritoneal pericardial diaphragmatic hernias is a lot of them are asymptomatic. Uh, so um, it's not uncommon for um, cats, uh, especially to have thoracic radiographs and um, uh, PPDH to be picked up incidentally. So it, it's, it would be unusual for a, a PPDH to present um, as an acute onset dyspnea. Um, but yeah, it, it's on the list in terms of what, what might be going on. Uh, sorry, do you, do you think an ultrasound it may help us in this case? Uh, yeah, so I think if, if, if we were kind of querying whether or not there was a diaphragmatic hernia here, then yeah, an ultrasound would help. So um, if, if you pop the probe on the ventral abdomen here um, and just sort of fanned dorsally, um, then what you'd expect to see is, is a nice clear diaphragmatic margin on the ultrasound. Um, and if there's a diaphragmatic hernia or rupture, then you wouldn't see that. Um, 
be discontinuous. And um, hopefully, if there is a hernia there, and there's potentially maybe some fat just poking through into the um, pericardial sac, then we'd be able to pick that up on ultrasound. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any anything else worth considering? Here? So one, one of the things that, that struck me when I looked at these films is just how lucent the right side of the thorax is, just how lucent the uh, right lung is. Uh, and also, as you guys have pointed out, this the soft tissue structure here. And given that we've got a soft tissue structure in the left hemithorax, um, it, it begs the question, where where the heart is, really, because we really expect the heart to be here, and, and it's not. So I, I wonder whether this might actually be this patient's cardiac similar. Certainly, I could believe that this was part of the cardiac similar, and if, if it isn't here, then where is it? Well, we've got this soft tissue structure here, so could it be that this patient has a really profound uh, mediastinal shift to the left, and if it does have a really severe mediastinal shift to the left, then what could be causing that? Um, we talked a little bit about how lucent uh, these these lungs look, and uh, if if we think we can see uh, hyperlucent lungs and, and gas lucency within the thoracic cavity, then um, we're thinking, well, is is there a pneumothorax here, um, or uh, is this just massively inflated lung? And um, Something like I say, a tension in the thorax would do that. If, if you had a tension in the thorax, um, then uh, the affected side, um, there would be um, such an increase in pressure on that side because of the continuous leakage uh, in, of gas into the pleural space that that would, that would push the cardiac silhouette and the other mediastinal structures to the opposite side. But there isn't really anything here to suggest that this patient has a pneumothorax. Even though this is hyperlucent, I think we can, we can actually follow the pulmonary structures right the way out. To the periphery. So we can still see the, the bronchus and we can see the pulmonary vessels um, and we can see tiny little bronchi going right out to the periphery but we can't really see at the edges of um, the lung lobes there so there's nothing really to suggest that there's a pneumothorax in this view and, and again in, in this view uh, I'm not really convinced uh, I can see uh, any evidence of, of, a, of a pneumothorax. I can't really convince myself that we've got um, collapsed lung lobes. Um, it, is, it is possible that, that this, this here could be a collapsed lung lobe. Um, and if it is a collapsed lung lobe, then it's going to be, uh, as, as, as we pointed out, this, this left cranial lung lobe. So uh, it could be that this, this little border here is the collapsed left cranial lung lobe. And, and this is the cardiac right here. And we're not entirely sure why this effacement of the borders of the cardiac right and the diaphragm, but we can't really see anything in this DV view to convince us that there is a diaphragmatic hernia um, or um, pleural effusion, for example. Um, it could be that this, this is a little low bar sign here, and it, it could be that this is this is the collapsed left cranial lung lobe here, which which we can see here. But that doesn't really explain why this this cardiac silhouette is pushed so far uh, over to the left. Uh, so. In, in such a young dog, three weeks old, is, is there anything, is there any condition that you guys might have heard of that, that might do this? And like I say, I don't know what the answer is here. I don't have a definitive diagnosis. Um, I can tell you that this, this puppy didn't live very long, unfortunately, after these radiographs were taken. Um, is, is there anything that you guys might have heard of that in such a young dog might result in uh, radiographic changes like a very marked mediastinal shift to the left, um, big hyperlucent lung, um, particularly on the right. There are some other features that are described in this condition. I'm not convinced that we can see them here. So um, in this particular condition, uh, because of the increase in, in pressure in the lung, which results in that mediastinal shift, you can get straightening of the costochondral cartilages. You can maybe argue that there might be some straightening here, but I think that, that remains to be seen. And then um, you get increased tapering of the vessels and the bronchial part of the periphery. I'm not pretty sure that's here, but certainly a profound mediastinal shift, probably some collapse of 
of the left between your uh, lower leg as well. So the only other thing that, that I, I can think of here um, is there is a condition called uh, congenital lobar emphysema um, where you get um, a really enlarged emphysematous right middle lung lobe and uh, that's certainly something that you would expect to see in a very young dog and in patients that are affected um, they do present with very acute onset dyspnea and it's uh, due to a, a cartilage defect um, within the bronchi that uh, effectively creates a one-way valve. It's usually the right middle lung lobe that's affected and as a result of that cartilage defect um, you uh, get air coming into the lung but the air can't get out of the lung and the right middle lung lobe gets super enlarged um, as a result of that um, you get the radiographic changes that we just talked about. So you get this uh, mediastinal shift, you get hyperlucent lungs, um, the right lung tends to look a lot bigger than the left lung, particularly the right middle lung lobe, which is the one that's normally affected. Um, and then you get some other signs um, that um, you uh, see with increased pressure in the chest, like straightening the costochondral cartilages. Um, so that, that was the only other thing that I um, considered in this case. Um, it, it's not confirmed. And um, it, it could just be that, that this little puppy has just got a collapse of this uh, left cranial lung lobe. Um, and, and that collapsed lung lobe has just resulted in a cardiac silhouette just swinging over to the left side, which is, is causing this really profound uh, mediastinal shift. Um, the thing that you can do um, to try and decide whether there's a congenital lobar emphysema um, is um, use a horizontal beam technique um, to uh, acquire um, a thoracic radiograph, um, so uh, a DV um, or a VD, I'm not sure it really matters. Uh, with the patient um, in uh, right lateral recumbency. And what you'd normally expect to see in um, that uh, view, um, so a horizontal decubitus view, um, would be the uh, dependent lung lobes being collapsed. Um, so if the dog is lying on its right side and you're taking a horizontal beam projection, um, then those lung lobes on the right would normally collapse. And if you have a patient with a congenital lobar emphysema, um, then because of uh, that congenital cartilage defect that we talked about and the fact that we've got this huge great right middle lung lobe that's full of gas um, that, that doesn't happen um, so the right middle lung lobe stays super inflated and super big despite the fact that the patient is in lateral recumbency um, and then that, that pretty much nails the diagnosis on for us. So the reason why I included this uh, set of radiographs is um, I thought they were pretty tricky to interpret um, particularly this lateral view um, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of this condition called uh, congenital lobar emphysema and um, just have a little chat about how the, the patients with congenital lobar emphysema normally present and what sort of changes you'd expect to see on radiographs. I can't say that that's what this dog had because I don't know what this dog had um, but um, it would be on my differential list I think. What? Anybody have any questions about that? Um, and that was that's a tricky one too. And the take-home message for you guys is there is something called congenital lobar emphysema and um, it occurs in very young patients and they present as acutely and profoundly dyspneic and on thoracic radiographs you will see um, usually a mediastinal shift to the left because it's the right middle lung that's affected, a big hyperlucent right lung um, and that's because the right middle lung lobe is full of gas um, and if you take uh, a right lateral view using a horizontal beam then that right middle lung lobe doesn't collapse despite the fact that the patient is in lateral recumbency. Uh, I mean and those patients need surgery to remove um, that huge right middle lung lobe. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of papers out there um, and case series um, that describe this condition so congenital lobar emphysema. All right. Anybody have any questions about this one? Like I said, I, I, I don't have the answer. Yet. Can I ask a question? I yeah. mean, in congenital lobar emphysema, you're not expecting to have like more, I like just I like a sort of huge bulla, so one lobe really hyper loosened, um, sort of highlight by um, a capsule like a, a radio radio peak remanencing sort of. Um, do, I you don't, know, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So. 
uh, I, I think it, it does vary. So I think if, you know, if you have uh, like a giant right middle lung lobe, to, and, and it's it's so enlarged that you know the edges have started to become rounded, then it, it might start to look a little like a bulla. But but typically a bulla would be well, it would have a uniform uh, gas opacity, so it would be uniformly radiolucent. Whereas an emphysematous right middle lung lobe doesn't look like that. You, you still see the pulmonary architecture. Um, it's because the bronchi and the vessels and all of the other structures that are normally within the lobe are still there. It's just bigger and more full of gas than it would normally be. Um, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't expect to see a, a bulla-like structure within the right middle of thorax in a patient that had congenital lobe I, I'd expect to see uh, a, a hyperlucent uh, right hemithorax. Normally it's, it's pretty tricky to, to make out which lobe is which in those patients because everything is so abnormal um, because the right middle lung lobe is so huge and it's pushing the right cranial lung lobe cranially and it's pushing the right cordial lung lobe cordially. And I haven't seen tons of tons of these to be honest. This is something that um, you don't see very often um, and uh, a lot of um, a lot of what I'm passing on to you guys is is based on um, descriptions that I've seen in case series. Um, this, I've never had one of these myself clinically, um, but they, they are out there, um, and it's a condition that, that has been described. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Um, what about pul no? pulmonary um, hypoplasia? Could it be anything? Um, pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, I know that's rare as well, but whether it will fit with the um, x-rays, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Anyone have any other comments about this case or any, any other case that we've had this evening? If not, then, then that takes us up to the end. So those are our four cases. And all that remains is for me to, yeah, thank all of you guys for joining me this evening. And a uh, special thanks to um, everyone that uh, contributed and uh, presented a case. Um, I thought you were all excellent. And that is essentially what these sessions are about. Um, it's essentially uh, an opportunity for us to have a chat um, about uh, some interesting cases. Um, and the more that you guys get involved, hopefully the more you get out of it. So, yeah, special thanks to everybody that presented the case this evening. Uh, the only other thing for me to say uh, before we uh, retire is that um, not for this session, but for the remaining sessions this year, we are now going to be able to issue you guys with CBD certificates. Uh, we will do that via a link on our website. Um, so for those of you who are anxious to have proof that you have completed at least an hour's worth of CPD this evening, then there will be opportunity for you to acquire CPD certificates um, through our website and a link. All right, so there we go. So thank you all for joining me. Um, I hope you will join me again um, next month. Um, have a very nice evening and everybody uh, stay safe in these difficult times and I will catch up with everyone again um, next month. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye